Welcome to Whiskey Lore, the interviews. I'm your host, Drew Hanish, the best-selling author of Whiskey Lore's Travel Guide to Experiencing Irish Whiskey and Experiencing Kentucky Bourbon. And today we are headed to Killarney on the Emerald Isle to talk some whiskey and history with a man who is developing a fine series of whiskeys. And they are backed not only by the stories of his family, but also integrating some of the grains from his estate. And so we're going to learn all about that, some family history and more from Wayward Spirits, the home of the Liberator and Lakeview Estates brands. Uh, I'm honored to welcome Sir Morris O'Connell. Morris, welcome. Thank you, Drew. It's great to be here. Yeah, well, it's great to chat with you again. We had a, a great visit when I was there in Ireland, yeah. and it was it's it it's sort of um, when you're planning out a trip and you're going to all of these distilleries, and then you see a brand that's that's there but there's not really a tour uh, associated with it. It surrounds it in mystery. And so, <laughs> so it was we great. Do meet, for... We do mean to be mysterious, but uh, we're just not <laughs> set up for tours. It's difficult enough making the whiskey uh, without, without, without d d doing the tours as well. So we're, yeah. we're not set up for that at the moment. Well, let's uh, let's jump in first, because I want to introduce everybody to you, and then we'll get into talking about some um, uh, family history, the estate, and also the whiskeys. But um, what got you interested in getting into the whiskey industry at the beginning? I wasn't sure I wanted to be in the whiskey industry. I was always a, I always, uh, in, I was an, um, had an amateur uh, enjoyment of of whiskey, uh, drinking whiskeys. Uh, whiskey in Ireland uh, is generally a huge industrial. Uh, undertaking and until about 2015 it wasn't possible to do it on the craft scale that we we can now so it wasn't really an option it was something that had been i'd been nagging at me for for decades i wanted to do something that connected with my family history that shared shared our love of this place uh and shared some of our stories with people and uh, it just isn't whiskey a fantastic thing for doing that. It's a great vehicle for for talking to people and uh, and um, yeah, chatting. Uh, yeah, so that was uh, and sort of in 2015, 2016, uh, with the advent of uh, wholesalers such as Great Northern and West Cork Distillers, it became possible to for a small brand like ours to have our grain distilled by by one of the bigger players and uh, and to buy uh, spirit that we could mature ourselves. So that made the the, the business uh, uh, possible back in 2015. So it took us about three years to, to get the bonded storehouse set up here uh, and longer and longer and longer. Eventually we got, uh, we launched in 2020. Uh, so, uh, yeah, it's taken a long time to get here, but there we are. Yeah. Interesting that when I took my first trip around the Ring of Kerry and was doing my trip around the southern part of Ireland, and this was 2019, that um, Dingle was the only distillery, really, that other than yeah. Middleton and the ones in Dublin, that I really even knew about at that time. And it was interesting, the attitudes. Uh, as we were doing the tour... I had planned all these scotch distilleries I was going to on that trip. And so it was mostly okay. a scotch whiskey trip. But I decided since I was flying into Dublin, I would take a little spin around Ireland to look at castles and uh, and drink Guinness. And so that was really kind of my, my goal of that portion yeah. of the trip. But then I saw there was a distillery, Dingle, and I said, okay, well, I'll stop off and, and visit. But there was really no... Uh, um, even when I talked to them, there was this whole mystery around what Irish whiskey, you know, if there were any other distilleries, they said, we're working with one other startup really. But other than yeah. that, we can't, we can't tell you what's going on in the Irish whiskey well, industry. Well, isn't it amazing? Everyone comes to the same conclusion at the same time. And so I know at least two other, two other people who, uh, for whom the distinct Dingle distillery prospectus came across their, their desks back in I think it might have been 2012 and mm -hmm. suddenly what what we we sort of been 
thinking about the back, back of our heads suddenly actually became became possible and jingle jingle showed us that that was possible uh and uh yeah so th i think that was the genesis for for at least two other two other brands i know of and probably a lot more yeah it seems interesting that uh that killarney was a little late in coming into this i say late <laughs> in sort of a perspective of just a few years of, of this yeah. growth of the irish whiskey industry but now you have three distilleries or three different brands that are coming out of uh killarney just in a very small period of time and and all within uh about a mile within within a mile <laughs> on on the same road one of them is 500 yards up one side the other one's 500 yards up the other the other side so uh, yeah it's uh, it but it's great i mean the we I, there will be competition locally for shelf space there's bound to be uh, and generally in ireland there is a lot of competition for shelf space but we're all it, um, we're all small brands in in the, the world scheme of things. So actually, the three brands together actually does make a does does make for a, a grouping which will enable people to to understand the area and hopefully we can show that what we're doing in the area is different. Um, and I know that the other two have plans for for tourist. Uh, 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 for tours, um, so um, hopefully that will spread the word about whiskey in Killarney. And we're better to, I mean, there's the old saying that the, the best place to open a shoe shop is near other shoe shops. Mm -hmm. uh, so ho hopefully people will come to the area looking for whiskey and uh, and just that there is there is a critical mass there. I hope. Just yeah, well, well, I think the the surprise to me is that that is such a great tourist area. I mean, the the oh, draw yeah, yeah. to go down yeah. to the Ring of Kerry, and now there's going to be distilleries down that direction too. So, I mean, for the whiskey fan, it it really gives them an yeah. opportunity to absorb a lot in just a small area. And Killarney and Kerry is extraordinary. the 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 number of people it's the second most visited part of of Ireland. And that, that's it, both, inter, both international tourists and, and Irish tourists. And if I want to get hold of somebody, the chances are that they're passing through Killarney in the summer or Kerry <laughs> in the summer. Uh, I mean, it is, it is extraordinary. And people, significant people who are, would be of significant interest to me. It's, but unfortunately, too many times you hear that they've been and gone. Uh, but uh, well, we managed to grab a few people and uh, tell our story along the way. So, Yeah. Well, let's talk about, uh, you have a beautiful estate there. When I stepped out, I'm a big James Bond fan. So as soon as I stepped out, and you're right on the, the lake there and you got the mountains right behind it. It's like you you feel like I should have driven up in my Aston Martin instead of <laughs> driving up in my little rental car I was in. But uh, talk talk a little bit uh, about the history of that estate because it I think it's fascinating that uh, you have family ties on uh, both your mother and father's side that yeah, yeah. come to come together to relate to this property. Yeah, I mean the 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 house I'm in at the moment is uh, is from about 1870, and the O'Connells came to this land in 1820, and as it turns out, the land had previously been in my mother's family, the McCarthy's family, for about 700 years before then. So between the two families, we can and I do claim to have been on this land for about 900 years. Which is, I mean, every whiskey brand has to have a has to have a, a date, and I don't think there's anybody <laughs> else who goes goes uh, before that. But uh, the uh, but uh, you don't really want to be the one to sort of drop the ball after nine hundred years. Uh, so there is a certain amount of pressure in that regard. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's uh, well. I deal with dates all the time, and of course, when I was visiting, uh, I, I had brought up the. Uh, the thing about Bushmills and their uh, their statement of uh, 1608, and it's yeah. so funny now. After coming back and then starting to work on the Whiskey Lore Stories podcast and really digging into that history and trying to figure out, you know, what does that the date relate to? And then talking to Daryl McNally at Limavady, and you know, he's saying, well, you know, our property was also in that same. Uh, 
area, the 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 route uh, on the northern mm -hmm. part of of Ireland and in, in Ulster, um, that th these dates, um, everybody's so hung up on them, but they are yeah. so un but they're so unclear. That's the thing yeah. is that we we want and to have it's irrelevant. Them, yeah, and it's irrelevant too. I mean, <laughs> the 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 one that we all get hung up over here uh, is is the is the uh, the first mention of of whiskey uh, distilling uh, on paper, and uh, and for us, uh, it's um, uh, it's seven hundred years next year is yeah. the is the, the first well, that's, the first recorded. That's true, thirteen twenty four, right? Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, so we're we're all planning to celebrate that, but the the Scots uh, uh, are uh, just don't don't accept that. Uh, <laughs> it's 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 neither here nor there. They've done the Scots have done a fantastic job uh, over educating the world on whiskey. We we dropped the ball for many centuries. Uh, and and we're 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 having to we're 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 coming from from behind to try and uh, to try and push ourselves forward now. And yeah. uh, I mean, the I was at a show the other day where the there was a Scotch uh, uh, stand saying 150 years of history, and we were all planning to go up to them and tell them about 700 years of Irish whiskey <laughs> history. <laughs> but yeah. uh, still. Life's too life's too short to get get hung up on those things. The Scots yeah. have have done a superb job of convincing the world that the only decent whiskey is a single malt, which actually means nothing other than it's from one particular place, and that that the only whiskey worth drinking uh, is a is twelve years or older. Um, but yeah, and that's really what we're try having to to try and uh, battle on the on an international front because they've done such a good work, job of convincing the world. Yeah, well, and it's interesting to really dive in. I had this discussion with somebody the other day about age statements and and the idea of um, you know how much will you pay for an age statement? And I said, you know what, I'd rather pay for the taste and quality of the spirit yeah. than I would exactly. The, Exactly. The age statement, because uh, yeah. there, there are plenty of 30 year old whiskeys out there that are selling for thousands of dollars. The question is, uh, you know, how do they taste? Is it yeah. worth, uh, you know, from the experience or is it for bragging rights just to have it up on the shelf? So, yeah, yeah. no, it's interesting. And I think what I when I first got into learning about Irish whiskey, my opinion was coming from a Scottish point of view, which was, boy, when the Irish get into doing single malts, this will be, you know, really interesting. But what I learned when I got to Ireland was the Scots can't do single pot still. And single pot still to me is a fascinating style of whiskey. Yeah, I agree. I agree a hundred percent. And on age statements, the, we don't, we don't put age statements on our whiskey because every batch is different. And you might find the age statement changes would would have to change, and on our core range, the 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 Liberator Malt and Tawny Port, the whiskies that are in that range from there's probably ten percent which is five years old. The majority of it will be seven or eight, seven years old, and there's fourteen year old in it. But we'd have to put the age of the youngest spirit in it, which would be five years, and it doesn't bear any relation to the quality of the of the whiskey. So I'd rather not just get stuck in that down that rabbit hole. But it, it's yeah. an education process. You've got and not it not not everyone will will understand that. Yeah. I, and I think if you were if you take it from this point of view, if you had a whiskey that was 20 years old and and when you are sitting there as a blender saying, if I take this barrel that's five years old and I put a little bit of it in there yeah. and it makes it that much better, then how are you being cheated yeah. right? Yeah. by not yeah. it, just because you're going to have to lower to a five-year age statement and that yeah. will stop you from creating a better whiskey yeah. than what you have. So Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Interesting. So, um, so getting back into the into the family history, let's let's jump back a bit. One of the things that I loved in doing my research about Irish whiskey history was the connection with Spain. 
there, uh, the, the idea that, um, that, that you had Spanish ships bringing up, I, I found in the 1700s mentions of, of Spanish hogshead barrels being used it for by yeah. Irish uh, distillers. So, you know, we talk about when did they start using these barrels? What types of barrels were they using? But there was this great connection between Spain and Ireland. And yes, I mean, it was, it was very, it was very fashionable. Even back in 1450, when my family were in a, my O'Connell family were in the McCarthy Castle, and, uh, and they were guarding it for the McCarthys, my mother's family, and the two families are, are interlinked over the centuries. But in 1450, we were down the coast here in a place called Ballycarbury Castle, importing wines and spirits from Spain and Portugal, which was a which was the height of fashion in those days. And there were a lot of Spanish people living here, having uh, having uh, and with having leather. That, that they came over with with leather making skills, um, and and it was a it was a, it was a it was a recognised trade. Uh, so uh, we try and use casks that have a connection with our family history. So the the we've started off with port, um, and uh, we we have some sherry casks as well. I particularly like port. That's that's why we we started on that one, um, and. Uh, um, yeah, it, it's it's good to reconnect with that. So, um, in 1450, there was one of my ancestors who was known as Morgan of the Wine, uh, and he, because the uh, he had uh, the, he and his brother lived in the same castle, and the, the McCarthy chieftain was coming to visit them with a view to giving one of them a promotion. And the the they were both vying to to uh, to entertain the McCarthy chieftain, and he said, "Well, look, the first whichever of you has your meal ready the first, I will come and dine with him." Uh, and so the the Morgan was living on the first floor of the castle, uh, but his canny brother Morris, after whom I'm named, lived on the ground floor and sort of thought a bit and and blocked up the door to his brother's. Uh, to his brother's first floor access, so that he wasn't able to get in any fuel to cook his meal with. Uh, <laughs> but uh, Morgan of the wine was so called because he, because at the time they were importing Spanish, uh, what they called licorice, but was actually a brandy, and he used the brandy to cook the meal, and uh, then was the first to uh, to have his meal ready for the McCarthy, McCarthy chieftain and got got the promotion because of that so uh, my namesake didn't come out very well after that and there we are. <laughs> how, how do these stories just flow down through the family i mean that's this is uh, it's it's fun to hear these oh uh, absolutely you, yeah. you won't find I mean, the them whole in history book no, and uh, and I must say I, I'm rather more interested in, in the anecdotal side of history uh, than the than the the dates, uh, most because I can't remember most of the dates. But uh, but we were as I say we were there importing wine spirits for 1450, and that was a legal business in those days. And it was only in 1661 when the English Parliament brought in excise duties that what we'd been doing for centuries suddenly became taxable, that we weren't really uh, uh, happy with that. So we carried doing on doing what we'd been doing for centuries, only they called it smuggling. Uh, so uh, so we, we have on our, on our uh, part of our label, we, we have, uh, it's a proudly wayward since 1661. So- uh, Nice. Um, we date we date our waywardness from from having to start becoming smugglers. Um, so uh, yeah, we were doing that for quite a while. Um, <laughs> so the um, prior to that, you the the castle. I'm, I take it uh, Valley Carberry Castle does not exist anymore. Is there oh, it any? Does. It does. Oh, it, it does. does. Okay, it okay. does. And and for some quirk of of history, I'm. Uh, Still, Lord of the Manor of Ballycarbury Castle. Ah, okay. Which I've always imagined gives me a sort of joie de seigneur of the virgins of Ballycarbury par Parish, but since they're nearly all bovine, uh, it's not something I've, <laughs> I've actually made any use of. But uh, yeah, it's 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 
it's, it is still there. It's been ruined since about, uh, well, Cromwell sacked it in 1628 or thereabouts, Cromwell's troops. Yeah. Uh, and uh, uh, and it, it's been a picturesque ruin ever since. But it's amazing uh, it's still standing, actually, after all that time. How far is it from where you're at? About 25, 25 miles. Okay. Is it on the, right on the coast? Yes, it is. Uh, okay. Near, uh, and uh, I don't know if you went down to Skellig 618, our neighbors yeah. in Carasavine, who, who now got whiskey out. Uh, they, they look out over it, and uh, uh, it's part of their, their, their story as well. So it's nice yeah. to spread the, the love. I was going to say, do they uh, do you, do they ask you for uh, rent to uh, look over it and make sure everything? <laughs> no, my uh, my I... wife my wife thought it was would be a great idea to to buy this ruin, uh, and uh, but the in Ireland we have such difficulties with uh, public liability uh, that uh, if anyone falls or hurts themselves. Uh, you would be sued. So I, I think yeah. we, we don't don't need any more risk like that. <laughs> so it was interesting in, uh, I, I would hear the name Cromwell while I was uh, going around the island. And um, I, I as, usually was a spit after it. Yeah. As, as, <laughs> as, as, an, as an American, that was the, uh, that was a tricky part of me doing a series on Irish whiskey. I didn't know that much about Cromwell. To me, Cromwell was that bump in the road in the mid, midst of the uh, English monarchy where all of a sudden, oh, they're out yeah. for a little while, they're back in. Um, yeah. But we, we don't get a lot of his history. Then when I had to start, um, I would talk to people there about history and I would say the name Cromwell and I would get this look. <laughs> and then um, as I started doing the research and started telling the story, I um, it was interesting looking at it as an outsider, but it was also touchy because it was like, I know I have an Irish audience that's going to be listening to this. And I'm going to try mm. to be as evenly handed about this as, as possible, but he's he's not very well why, loved. Why there, be but. even handed? There's no point to be even handed after all this time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but basically, in, in the early 1600s, uh, the, a, a guy called Guy Fawkes Catholic tried to blow up the Houses of Parliament and uh, upend the, the 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 English Parliament, uh, and so so began suppression of the Catholics, and the, the English brought in um, the, penal, the penal laws, which basically prohibited Catholics from owning land, uh, being in any business, being in the in the the any profession, uh, being educated or having the vote, and. This, these, this, these are some of the things that my forebear Daniel O'Connell, known as the Liberator, uh, was involved in in upending. Um, but it took it took many hundreds of years. So yeah, Cromwell was over to try and suppress any possibility of Catholics rising up and uh, and and take and and rebelling. Yeah, it's. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, I uh, plus, he apparently Wexford and Drada were uh, kind of sore points too, where those were the ones that were tricky for me because the um, uh, I would read somewhere that said uh, you know that it's taken like Drada the situation there where basically it was kill everybody, anybody that had uh, so uh, men, women, and children were being killed, and then I'm reading other versions that are going. No, it was the men and that mostly that anybody who had a weapon in their hand was the one. Right. That, that you, so it's like uh, you read that and you go, okay, how do I how do I cover this? Uh, yeah. And you know, so um, but it's a it's a it's an interesting thing to learn history and then go to another place where that history took place and mm -hmm. learn because. The first time I came through, I just went through looking at castles, and I was reading these these boards, and I was realizing I kn I knew nothing about Irish history. Yeah, uh, you know, it's just, it's not taught in American schools, yeah. uh, and so or, the thing or in English schools for that matter. So, uh, well, so it, it, there, there's quite there's quite an education piece in the UK trying to tell people about our, our history, and it's all such a long time ago that that um, there are people for whom it, it does feel as if it's yesterday, but uh, but it it was a long time ago, and we we're, we're as a nation we're sort of quite forward looking now, and uh, and yeah, I, I think I think we're 
that we're it's better if we're looking forward rather than yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah. so um, past problems. So there are no more connections with your family in history. Um, talk about who the wild geese were and your family's connection. Um, the wild geese were because, as I told you, under the penal laws, Catholics weren't allowed to be be in any educated or so. If you wanted to make make uh, a name for yourself, if you wanted to do anything, make something of yourself. Generally, you had to go off to the continent to either be educated or um, or go and fight in in wars on the continent. And there was a a, a, a group called the the Wild Geese who went and fought in in or a regiment of Irish second sons usually uh, who went off to fight in uh, fight in wars on the continent. And uh, one of my ancestors was the the last uh, colonel of this brig Irish brigade. A uh, man called Count Daniel O'Connell, uh, but yeah, there were there were extraordinary people in extraordinary times. And what what the, the sort of two sides of it were that after we left Ballycarbury Castle, uh, we moved up the coast to a place called Derrynane, uh, which is the second most beautiful place in Ireland after here. Uh, and uh, we we carried on smuggling there and. It was ideal for that because it was a natural harbour hidden from the sea. So the revenue ships would go past and not see what was happening. There were mountains surrounding it so people couldn't get in. And anyone who did get in, who wasn't either an O'Connell or, no, or an O'Sullivan, tended to stick out. So we had this little magical kingdom there where we were, were trading um, uh, with the continent and and trading often with lots of cousins around the place because we'd have had cousins in in Bordeaux and uh, in Spain and in Portugal and Italy and we would have been trading with them and what was what was interesting was where we were you be you've been to this part of Ireland it's right at the edge of Europe uh, and the next we say the next parish is America so we were we were much more outward looking. Than, than looking inwards at our own country because Dublin, which would have been our our, our capital, would have been the the, uh, the capital of the Protestant ascendancy, who really didn't want to have much to do with us. So mm. uh, so all of our energy was was focused outwards on on the continent, and we would have had more connection with those capitals than we would have with our own capital. And uh, so, what my one of my ancestors, another Morris O'Connell. There's a lot of Morris O'Connell in this story. <laughs> uh, a guy known as Hunting Cap, uh, because the, he the English brought in a tax on gentlemen's hats, and to stick two fingers, he he wasn't really having that either. So he started wearing a, a velvet hunting cap. So he's known as Morris Hunting Cap O'Connell. And uh, he uh, had a fleet of seven or eight ships going to and fro from the continent, importing luxury goods. Uh, and the trade in the other direction would have been the animal hides and salt and things like that, but also young men going off to make their fortune on, on the continent. So it was, it was very present in their lives that, that you had to go off and, and, uh, and make, your, make your name elsewhere. Um, so it, it was an extraordinary time, an extraordinary generation of people. It's interesting that there was a velvet cap whiskey. Do you think it has any relation? <laughs> um, no, it doesn't, because there, yeah. there's a race. We were actually originally going to going to uh, our brand was originally going to be hunting cap whiskey. Okay, uh, uh, but uh, the the people I spoke to said, oh, well, that's going to upset people who don't like hunting. So, uh, <laughs> and, and then we found that it was possible to to name it the Liberator instead. So that was yeah. a much more resonant name for us. Um, so, let's, so let's get into the story of uh, of Daniel O'Connell because he is a very interesting, uh, very interesting person, extraordinary man. Yeah. Yes, who uh, has connections. Uh, here to the United States and has uh, hmm. connections to uh, was it uh, was it Belgium or uh, oh right here okay yes yes yeah, yeah. Uh, connections everywhere actually so yeah. uh, the um, Daniel O'Connell so Darren Arn, Hunting Cap uh, Hunting Cap's nephew was a man called Daniel O'Connell and uh, 
the, um, uh, the hunting cap adopted, basically adopted his nephew and arranged for him to be educated in France. At this time, Count Dan, who was the, uh, who was the uh, last colonel of the Irish Brigade, was a general in the French court. Uh, and uh, he arranged for Dan to be educated in France because he couldn't be educated in Ireland. And so Dan went over to Ireland and sorry, over to France. And uh, he that coincided with the start of the French Revolution. And he saw the bloodshed of the revolution. And he vowed that he was going to make he was going to to uh, to get revolutionary change for Ireland, but using peaceful means only. So mm. this was unheard of at the time. Uh, revolutions are not peaceful. But people like Martin Luther King and Gandhi both acknowledge his influence in their autobiographies. Um, uh, Frederick Douglass, who you guys know, uh, mm. came to Dublin to learn from Daniel O'Connell. Uh, the, the, the reason he came was that when he was a slave, he would hear his masters uh, cursing the name of Daniel O'Connell. So he, he, he realized that this was the guy that he had to meet. So he came to Dublin <laughs> to learn from Dan and thereafter sort of called him, started calling himself the Black O'Connell. Uh, because at the time, Dan was, was very involved in anti-slavery campaigning as well. Uh, the, uh, so the, and where, where we were down in Deranan, uh, they were very hospitable hosts down there. So people would come from all over Europe to, to, to come and, and learn from Daniel O'Connell. Uh, often there would be 30 or 40 people around the dinner table um, uh, who'd come from all over all over Europe, uh, and uh, one of them was a was a, a German prince who wrote a book about about the O'Connells, and uh, this got to re- reference your point with with Belgium. The he he gained a certain amount of fame in Belgium to the extent that when Belgium got its independence from the Netherlands in I think 1830, they decided they wanted to have a constitutional monarchy. So they uh, um, they approached some members of the Belgian cabinet, approached Daniel O'Connell and asked him if he would allow his name to go forward to be on the ballot to become king of Belgium. So yeah, unfortunately, Dan said no because he had still had too much to do in Ireland. But uh, yeah, being part of the Belgian royal family might have done me a bit of good at some stage, but. Yeah. Well, th- there was a, uh, prior to the, um, acts of union, there was an Irish uprising slash revolution, Wolf Tone, that, that whole time yeah. period. Did, did he take part in that at all? No, not really. Um, he was in the background there. So, uh, it's yeah. not really part of his, uh, as a, as a young man, although he, he had, uh, he had eschewed violence he uh, he got maneuvered. He, he got maneuvered into uh, a duel with uh, with uh, uh, a man called Dester, and it basically he was he was set up because Dester was a uh, a crack shot in the the breast shot in the British Army. So uh, Dan got got forced into this duel with him, and it was assumed that he just he he would. He would he would be killed and he'd be out of everyone's way and not be a pain in the backside of authority from then on. But as it happened, Dan shot him and and killed the man, uh, mm. and he regretted this for the rest of his life. So uh, so that that also brought him on on towards peaceful protest. And what he did was basically he he used his oratory to mobilise the people of Ireland. Uh, which had never been done before, and got their voices heard for the first time, and forced the English Parliament into recognising Catholics and uh, and giving us a voice. So uh, and that was hugely important for Ireland. Although he's known, he's and for that he is known in Ireland as the Liberator. Yeah, uh, and Catholic Emancipation. Yeah, and often in yeah Catholic Emancipation is is. I, you, you, you've mentioned that to people, and their eyes glaze over. But, but <laughs> it, it, there's much more engaging stories about about anti-slavery campaigning uh, 
and he campaigned for Jewish rights, for women's rights. Basically, anyone who was downtrodden, he was on their side. And he was a complete pain in the backside for the, for the, for the establishment uh, to the extent that uh, our, our company is called Wayward Irish Spirits. And we, the name comes from an insult that the British Prime Minister, Robert Peel, levelled at Daniel O'Connell. He called him that wayward Irishman. So we've sort of taken that on with pride. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, there, there's, uh, he, he, wasn't, he wasn't universally popular, but, yes. uh, but internationally he, he had, a, had a huge following. It was interesting seeing the connection with him and Father Matthew, who I cover in the first episode. I do on you know. right, okay. Yeah, we we sort of gloss over that bit. Yes, Father yeah. Matthew was was a was a, was a, a temperance uh, uh, campaigner, <laughs> and yeah. uh, Dan Dan became very uh, friendly with him towards towards the end of his life, and became and and joined the temperance movement himself. Which doesn't really fit with the whiskey, but there we are. <laughs> Everyone's allowed an aberration at some stage. Well, Jack Daniel, uh, it, it, it'll uh, be good for you to know, became a uh, primitive Baptist, and they were uh, against um, uh, whiskey. So he actually gave up his business to become a prim primitive oh, wow, Baptist okay. at the end of nice. his life. Yeah. Well, so well, Dan funded his son to set up a brewery in Dublin. Uh, in competition with a certain uh, certain uh, Protestant business who, who continue to this day, and he was basically setting up a, a Catholic stout to 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 encourage people to buy to to buy Irish that were, uh, but it it folded quite quickly because nothing can nothing is is as good as Guinness, unfortunately. Yeah. So, <laughs> so he uh, did he ever. Because I know Father Father Matthew actually spent some time in the United States. Did uh, he ever go on any traveling campaigns in the no, U.S.? No, no um, he he didn't. No, there's too much to do here. Um, <laughs> yeah. Well, I know there was a there was a little bit of uh, frustration with Father Matthew when he went over because he threw away all of his anti-slavery uh, rhetoric at that time because he didn't want to upset anybody. Okay. And and so that uh, kind of made me wonder was did daniel o'connor uh o'connell get a chance to uh also make the the move over there to well, support he, uh, he, Douglas? he wasn't really very interested in in avoiding upsetting people uh it wasn't really in his makeup and yeah. uh, the, there was a lot of americans who wanted to to fund dan's movement and there was one particular guy i think he was called stevenson who was the the uh, U.S. ambassador to London, and offered to to give um, uh, to to fund Dan's Dan's work, uh, but Dan refused, calling him a slave breeder. So uh, he wasn't very subtle at the best of times. But uh, <laughs> so, so Stevenson uh, challenged him to a duel, uh, and because he was a pacifist, he was uh, he was um, he 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 he. he, he turned it down he, he was able to avoid that yeah yeah um, so, so this is what's interesting about going back and doing all this research on because i'm working on my tennessee whiskey history book right now and um you know this this idea of duels uh it's amazing how many famous people were actually in them i i'm covering andrew president andrew jackson uh, he carried a bullet in his uh in his body for the rest of his life that was oh, well, near okay. his heart because he got into a duel. But what was interesting about reading about it was that he had, um, uh, he was not a good shot. He was, uh, he was uh, the guy he was going up against, Charles Dickinson, was an expert shot. And so the question was, how is this guy going to survive in, in this duel that he's pretty much uh, at a loss, especially if the other guy gets to shoot first? Well, his, uh, his uh, second said, um, I want you to shoot first. If we can get you to, or I mean, if, I want you to shoot second. If we can get you to shoot second, because I have a plan. So what his plan was was he told him, he told him just um, uh, stand there strong and uh, and and don't move a muscle, and I will get get us out of this. So basically, when the expert shot Charles Dickinson points his gun, uh, the second is the one who calls for the shot. So he turns 
to uh, Andrew Jackson and says, are you ready? And then Dickinson's standing over there waiting for him to turn around and say, are you ready? But he doesn't. He just goes, fire, like that, and never looks at Dickinson. And Dick Dickinson's startled, so he just like, you know, shoots the gun <laughs> and doesn't, doesn't take a strong aim. He actually hit him uh, in the chest, and it was a button that saved Andrew oh, wow. Jackson's life. Oh, it it right. deflected the shot de deflected off of a button, but he ended up, uh, Jackson aimed back and killed Dickinson. So, uh, it's, it's just, you, you hear these stories, uh, Alexander Hamilton, our first secretary of the treasury was, uh, killed in a duel, uh, oh, with Aaron Burr, which became part of the, the play that everybody, uh, watches on Broadway now. Oh. And I wonder if they, realize you know all the stuff that went on between all the singing going on in the uh <laughs> in the broadway play how much uh i haven't watched it because it's kind of for me it's kind of like oh i know i'm gonna be critical of this thing all the way through <laughs> knowing the knowing the history behind it but um the other thing we is have interesting. we have another another um, uh, story about about duels around this bottle of the Lakeview Single Estate whiskey. So I, I, it's sort of an unusual bottle. And we choose it based on this bottle here, which is a bottle of perfume that was given to my grandmother on her wedding day in 1923. And if you see, it's got a glass neck and a glass stopper. So the the, when, when she got it and throughout its life, the glass stopper fused inside the glass neck. And as kids, we'd be offered money to, to try and open it, basically to keep us quiet for an hour or two. Uh, but we were never able to open it. So, uh, <laughs> so it, it sort of got iconic status in the household. And it's actually a perfume called Eau de Cologne d'Orsay and was started by a man called Count Alfred d'Orsay. And we only found out recently that Alfred Dorsey was a friend of Disraeli, the, who was another English prime minister. And, of course, Daniel O'Connell upset Disraeli at one stage to the extent that Disraeli challenged Dan to a duel. And, but Disraeli asked his friend Alfred Dorsey to be his second. So, uh, uh, so it, it's extraordinary that all these connections in history yeah. And uh, fortunately, Dorsey refused, so uh, so the duel didn't go ahead. Uh, <laughs> it's it's amazing that these guys survived as long as they did with all the duels Absolutely. that they were. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, um, so, so I have to ask you about the glass stopper. When did you, how old were you when you finally figured out how to get that thing open? It was only it was only about six months ago for a, 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 as a <laughs> as a dinner fueled by copious amounts of the Liberator, uh, we worked out that we put ice around the neck and uh, used, uh, sorry, ice around the stopper and used hair, three hair dryers at uh, different sides of the neck to, <laughs> to expand that. And eventually it came out. And actually it smells, uh, I won't say as good as it did at day one, because I think it's, it's just really heavy and cloying, but it tastes, uh, it smells as it, as it did on, in i suspect when it was made so wow. uh, yeah yeah <laughs> amazing with good seal there um so did you put a glass topper on your uh on your bottles no no we signed against that <laughs> <laughs> so we we have we have this this large wooden stopper uh okay saying, uh, proudly wayward yeah yeah um, on the lakeview also though was that yes, the, or, did yeah, you same one yeah. yeah yeah it's the same uh, one there uh, okay all right very nice so, uh, so there's a point in the history of uh, American whiskey, because I was talking with somebody the other day about this. Uh, uh, we we're talking about the history of moonshine. And I said, you know, literally the history of moonshine can't start until uh, the spirit becomes illegal. So uh, from, from that standpoint, we're talking about how long the history of moonshining in the mountains of North Carolina and Tennessee was. And I was going, well, it couldn't have been before... Uh, 19 or 1863 when the excise tax came yeah. along that uh there was there oh, were 1863 other, for you right okay 1863 right. yeah because right. we had one we had one in uh 1791 and that was alexander hamilton's uh famous tax that ended in the whiskey rebellion 
Uh, and then there was another, and that only lasted to 1800. Then there was another one to pay for the war of 1812 for about three years. And amazingly, both of those taxes, uh, which is unheard of in, in American history were both rescinded. Uh, nice. and, okay. and so after if we had long periods without, and then in, uh, 1862, I guess it was, uh, Abraham, Abraham Lincoln brought back the excise tax as a, as a temporary measure, although we still pay that income tax to this day. So, uh, uh that, that wasn't quite so temporary, but uh, in terms of, um, smuggling for your family, the idea being that you were smugglers up until what point was there a point where you suddenly became, uh, legitimate again? Yeah, I mean, in around 1820, uh, when uh, Daniel O'Connell was becoming politically prominent uh, and hunting cap by this stage was, I think, in his in his uh, 90s and going blind. Uh, so and the revenue were threatening to send a gunboat up the Kenmare Bay to start shelling the house. So the family decided that probably that was a good time to give up the, <laughs> the smuggling. So my side of the family moved here to Killarney in 1820 uh, with uh, a share of Hunting Cap's fortune. Uh, and uh, um, yeah, so uh, that, that was when we started to go legit. And when we, when we st set up our bonded storehouse here on the estate, uh, back in 2018, one of our initial uh, revenue officers was an amateur historian, and he was sort of tickled pink that the, the O'Connells were now asking permission to 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 deal <laughs> in alcohol. So uh, eventually, they granted it. But yeah, so let's talk about uh, we got a chance to walk around and and see your facilities. You're not distilling on site. No, uh, but you, no, but you part, so the ceiling comes later. We will, we will do that later. Yeah. And so, uh, but let's, let's talk first about your storehouse because your storehouse, uh, we got to get the name out of the way. It has a very interesting name that you guys, uh, didn't quite, um, have a full comprehension of until somebody clued you in on it. Uh, talk about that. Yeah. And the entrance to the the storehouse uh, is through an arch archway, and above the archway, a great uncle of mine put up a plaque in Mandarin Chinese, I, 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 traditional Chinese. I think it is um, saying "House of Contentment" in Chinese. And as growing up, I I always heard that it didn't really mean anything to me until my father-in-law. Uh, was then working in Hong Kong and brought a rubbing of it out there. And they, they said to him, I, you do realize that's a euphemism in Chinese for brothel. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, so, uh, so we didn't realize that, uh, but, uh, but I think we, he might have been having a joke at our expense. So our, <laughs> our bonded storehouse is now called the House of Contentment. Very uh, nice. So uh, it's a sort of, it's a, you've seen it, it's a, 300 year old stone building with two foot thick walls. Uh, it's quite damp and humid. Uh, and uh, so it's uh, it's our ideal place for, for maturing whiskey. Uh, and you were saying, as I say, we're not distilling, but what we're, what we're doing is we're, we've reintroduced the tradition of Irish whiskey bonding. So as you said, lo uh, uh, merchants would have got all their in the days before the big brands, merchants would have got all their their goods in barrels, wines, spirits, tea, even. Uh, and when they sold the contents of it, they they wondered what to do with it, and they realised that if they took it to their local distillery and filled it with whiskey, uh, it created fantastic new flavours. So every town had its own house, uh, and every pub or merchants would have their own house whiskies. They'd all be very different. Uh, so uh, we sort of brought that tradition along with others into the 20th, 21st century. So we commissioned spirit from seven different distilleries, which mm -hmm. we uh, blend, sorry, which we mature uh, from, uh, from new make spirit. Uh, and then we finish it, blend it and bottle it on site. So basically we're, we're using these as components for, for, for different whiskies. First whiskey that we brought out, which is this one, which is our malt in Tawny Port, uh, is a vatting of um, of 
whiskies from Great Northern Distillery and Cooley Distillery. Uh, nobody had, had, had done a vat of whiskey in Ireland for decades. Uh, it just seemed to me to be an obvious thing to do. Uh, and it was a sort of sign of where we're going with from here. So eventually you might find that we have whiskies being produced that, that, are, that have components from seven different distilleries. Uh, so th- th- that way we're not just uh, rebottling spirit from other distilleries. We are making it our own. This, it, whether you like it or not, is very different to the, the spirit that, that, that came to us in the first place. So, uh, so uh, yeah, we're making it our own. Um, and, uh, um, yeah. So uh, let's... let's yeah, let's talk about that process just a, a little bit then. Mm. In terms of uh, what you're doing, do are they aging in bourbon barrels initially and maybe getting it to you at a certain age, or are you uh, doing the entire aging on site? Um, mixture of both. To start with, we 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 bought some some mature spirit, uh, but uh, I think the it was there was some some older spirit, but most of it was two years two years old when we started so not at, at this stage it's it's seven or eight years old yeah. uh, and from then we 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 bought a lot of new make spirit which is maturing and is now uh, a lot of it's a lot of it is three to four years old now so we're we're bringing that on on stream as well mm-hmm. uh, well, talk about the idea of a vatted malt too. Is there a is there a difference between a blended malt, like if we're talking about a blended malt whiskey from Scotland, versus yeah. a vatted malt? Is it really kind of the same same concept? It's the same 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 thing. Okay. Uh, yeah. The uh, but vatted sounds nicer than blended. I mean, if you're trying to explain <laughs> to someone the difference between a malt uh, between a, a a malt whiskey and a, and and a blend, which which has grain whiskey in it as well, you don't want any more complications in the naming of it. Yeah. Uh, so, what are the connections that you have in terms of family connections to the barrels that you're you're bringing in? Yeah, and the it's really important to us a that the whiskey the barrels are really good quality. So it's important for us that the the liquid that was in them beforehand is really good, and that it's coming from a from a decent supplier who looks after their casks. So uh, the 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 car, the port casks that we have, um, I can't say where they're from, but but basically we're buying direct from the Kinta, so we're getting them really fresh. So mm-hmm. that this is a tawny port cast. You can see the color on that. The uh, the we're getting the casks refilled here within three weeks of them disgorging in Porto. So if we bought them through a wholesaler, um, they can be sitting around for six or nine months getting dried out. But these are really fresh uh, and make a big difference to the whiskey. The uh, the reason we chose Portugal to start off with, my wife has family in the north of Portugal and all our neighbors out there are the port wine families. So we know mm-hmm. them all quite well. Uh, and, uh, uh, and that enabled us to, 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 to get in, in close and do that. In fact, the, the first port barrels that I, I bought, I negotiated for in my best Portuguese. My wife forced me to learn Portuguese a few years ago. <laughs> it's been absolutely no use to me, but uh, but the but but it helped to negotiate for these these cars because a lot of these people don't don't actually speak English and do appreciate it if you if you make the effort to speak Portuguese. So my Portuguese is 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 okay. It was okay, uh, not perfect. <laughs> so and my wife is actually surprised that I didn't uh, return home with a, a bathtub or something instead of some barrels. But <laughs> fortunately, it turned out all right. Yeah. Uh, so. so when you're working with these fresh uh, barrels, though, it's I, I mean they could probably be pretty aggressive in terms of uh, impacting their flavors on a whiskey. Yep. Have you, did you have any situations early on where you went, whoa, I've just created a new barrel of port wine here rather than a, <laughs> well, than a whiskey? There, there is that. I mean, one guy, uh, we, 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 we did a, a, a special release, uh, which uh, basically what we do is that when, uh, when we finish them in the port barrels, the first, 
the first refill of the barrel might be for nine to 12 months. The next one might be for 15 months and the third one might be for two years. So we will blend the three of those together to, to create, create our malt and tawny port finish uh, because the first fill is, as you say, quite aggressive. Uh, mm. And some, someone, uh, someone remarked that, oh, it, it's almost port ski, which wasn't quite what we were looking for. <laughs> so so you, you, sometimes you have to blend, blend that out. But if you don't yeah. have, the, if you don't have the, the flavor there to start off with, you, you, you can't, there's nothing to blend out. Yeah. So uh, it's important to, to, get that, to get that impact. But the first fill is is often a little too aggressive for 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 retail. Although the geeks love it, yeah. Uh, so uh, uh, I mean, the longer you can leave it in the cask, the more the geeks love it. And uh, we've got <laughs> we've got we've got a, a cask which we're releasing as a as an exclusive with with uh, with the friends of Irish whiskey, which is a Facebook page, and the. The, the 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 whiskey was just left in the cask. We forgot about it basically uh, because it didn't fit into what we were planning. So it it got overlooked, and it was in the cask for about nineteen months. And mm. uh, so we we also had some grain which had been in the cask for about twenty two months, which was too long. They're together. They've been batting together in in a bourbon cask now for the past twenty almost two years. Uh, it's really, really, really uh, aggressively fruity, uh, but but they love it, uh, and uh, it would be what I like to dip into occasionally as well. Yeah, well, I was uh, surprised the other day. I went and bought a bottle of Edradour, uh Scotch, which is that they write on the bottle that they only go. Um, with first and second fill Oloroso sherry barrels. Yeah. And I didn't notice it. Well, when you buy it, it's in a tin. So you don't know what the whiskey looks like. The stuff looks like Coca-Cola. It is the <laughs> darkest, it is the darkest whiskey I have ever, that, that isn't a bourbon because you'll find, you know, cast drink bourbons that might be yeah. that dark, but you're, you're yeah. not going to find uh, Irish whiskey or Scotch whiskey, usually that dark, but it really does speak to, that first fill yeah. being very aggressive. And yeah. I don't think a lot of people realize that some of these distilleries will utilize a barrel for, you know, 20 years on the first run, and then it, they'll use it again for another 20 years. And then they'll use the yeah. third time for another 20 years. And that each, each of those different stages uh, creates a, a, a different impact on the, yeah. on the whiskey. Yeah, and that's the secret of blending. Well, that, that that's what blending is about: just making the best of of those three and not uh, not overpowering, not 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 making it overpowering. Uh, yeah. But there is a case for for it being overpowering from time to time. It's just <laughs> it, it 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 can be lovely. Yeah. Uh, so let's talk about the uh, the Lakeview Single Estate whiskeys hmm. that you're working on right now, because well, yeah, this, this is my new baby. Uh, ah. so this is from barley grown here and matured here. And what's really extraordinary, I mean, if you look at the color of that, uh, that's been in uh, red, it's been matured in a red wine cask. And uh, the uh, this is a pot still whiskey. Uh, do, do, do you want to explain what a pot still whiskey is? Yeah, yeah, we can do that. So it's, uh, and and in fact, I remember from our discussion that uh, basically we're, I don't know your percentage of unmalted and malted barley, but it's a combination 50, 50, of at least, yeah. okay, so it's at, at yeah. least 30% malted, at yeah. least 30% unmalted, yeah. and then 5% of something else, or yeah. if you want, and so you're using oats as yes. your other 5%. Yeah, yeah. Yes. but it's not even it's not even 5%, where we're, it's much lighter on that, Is it? It, okay. it's less than 1%. Um, okay. Well, on, in subsequent years, we we put we're putting a bit more in, uh, but uh, but um, but but the uh, we, we were keep keeping low low amount of oats in it because the fifty fifty works really well, uh, and uh, so the this was um, uh, bought from barley grown here in twenty nineteen, and. Uh, 
it was it, it came back to us from it's distilled for us by great northern distillery and came back here for maturation and uh, th- what's really interesting is that this is only three and a half years old when i when you were here i showed you i, I was telling you how we say in killarney we we talk about having four seasons in an hour and we that's not just rubbish we tell tourists it actually <laughs> exists because yeah. we have really changeable weather here. And each of those changes in weather is causes the, the whiskey to interact with the cask. So the way whiskey is maturing is, is it's going into the cask when it expands. And when it contracts again, when it gets colder, it comes out of the, out of the, the, the whiskey and it's going through this layer of charcoal on the side of, of the barrel where it's been burnt. And that's purifying it over time. So pot still whiskies generally are not drinkable at three years old. Uh, mm-hmm. You're normally having to wait five, six years old. But because of our microclimate here, we're getting much more interaction with the cask. And mm-hmm. I've been saying that this should make our whiskey mature more quickly. But now that we've actually got it in a bottle, I can actually prove to people that actually yeah. it does taste. Most people are saying it tastes like a seven or an eight-year-old whiskey. Uh, and it's been extraordinary to be able to prove that to prove that to people at long last. Yeah. Um, well, it's, it, well, it's interesting to me that uh, pot still whiskey. To me, in the U.S., we are exposed to. Uh, well, now we have green spot and uh, and yellow spot, but red breast was really it for the longest time. And being at a twelve year age statement, to me, yeah. I like them. I like them younger. So, mm. uh, from a pot still standpoint because I think there's so much of that early character that comes yeah. from the, uh, you know, your, your pepper notes, the nice, uh, yeah. uh, grain notes that you get in and the oiliness and the, and the, the oiliness. It, it, yeah. It, exactly. So I think, uh, that's, that's the other part of the secret weapon of pot still whiskey is that like American rye, uh, or peated whiskey, sometimes they're better earlier than they are, yeah. Yeah. you know, letting them go for long periods of time where they lose that character. Yeah. Well, we'll see how it how it matures. I mean, the the maturation isn't isn't a straight line, unfortunately. So it can go in and out of being good and bad. I mean, sometimes you go to a cask and it's really not doing very well. Then you come back again six months later, and and it it might be it might be tasting really well. So it's you're riding a tiger a bit you don't you it's uh, it's you don't really know where it's going to end up i don't know whether whether all i mean in each individual cask is different so i don't know whether my other casks uh, are going to be able to to produce the same the same quality of what we've got there so uh it it's yeah you don't know until until you you bottle it really yeah, um, this is the essence of whiskey. Well, the the yeah. the plus the plus is is that you have multiple barrels going on, so you can also maybe yeah. Play but we're with not we're bit. not like we're not we're we ours is is about as far from industrial whiskey as it gets. We don't have the we don't have the quantity of casks that that the big boys do to be able to blend out these inconsistencies. Uh, we um, we produce all of our whiskies are in small batches. Each one will be different, and so we mm. sort of rely on Oscar Wilde's maxim that uh, uh, consistency is the last refuge of the uninspired. So uh, <laughs> each of our batches will be different. So come back and you'll each time, and you'll find hopefully you'll find something different, or maybe something different to enjoy out of each batch. Yeah, um, which it. Which is, uh, I think, the reason why single barrel whiskeys have become so popular is that yeah. it does give you the opportunity to taste almost vintages in a way of yeah. of whiskeys because it's what did that barrel go through over yeah. a period of years? Yeah. Uh, how how tough was it for you to find a place to be able to take your grain and say, um, you know, we want to produce whiskey just using our grain because this is interesting you will be the first distillery in your area uh i think to really be using stuff that's been grown yeah. right right there yeah yeah well it's very rare in ireland for for the grain and the maturation to be in the same place uh and i think those are the two 
where where something is distilled, and Stiller will tell you something different, but where something is distilled doesn't, if there's no sense of place to where something is distilled. The type of still, yes, uh, but if you're, uh, you're, and if it's distilled by a Scotsman or distilled by an American or an Irishman, is that going to make a difference to it? I don't know. It's everyone is different, uh, yeah. but but where the barley is grown can be shown to make a make a difference. Where and we are now showing that where where the whiskey is matured makes a difference, uh, and. Uh, so, it, it, so getting it distilled, we had it distilled by Great Northern, and they were very good to us. They they kept our our grain separate. What was more difficult was was the malting of it, because when we first started, the our first crop was ten tons because we lost half of it from in a storm, and uh, the uh, so we had five tons of malted barley, and the. The, the malting is an industrial process in Ireland, and the, the I took it to the two malting companies, and and they said, oh yeah, one of them said our batch sizes are 100 tons, the other was 120 tons. They said, give us your five tons, we'll give you five tons out the other end, but that wouldn't have been mine. Uh, right. So we 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 found a guy up uh, called Gareth Heaton up in in Nace, uh, up near up the way up to Dublin, and. Uh, he malts in five ton batches for us. So for better or worse, it is my grain. It's malted alone. It's distilled <laughs> alone. So if it's bad, well, there's only me to, to blame. Uh, if, if it's good, hopefully so I, I'll get some, some credit for that. So the malting was, a, was, a, was an issue. Uh, and, and it's also really expensive to do it, to do it uh, in, in the small scale. I reckon yeah. it costs us about to grow the barley and to to distill it and mature it. It's costing us about eleven hundred euros uh, a ton, mm. uh, whereas I can go out and buy malted barley wholesale uh, for about four hundred fifty four seventy five a ton. So they're, they're, hopefully, there people will will realise that the provenance there's a value to that. Uh, I think there is, uh, and uh, yeah, it's. Um, but it was important to me to be able to stand behind it all the way and say, "This is this is the product of my land, that this is the spirit of this place." Um, yeah. and so th- that's been that's been a, a really important thing for us. That that would be uh, the other uh, option would be to take one of your buildings and turn it into a, a malting house, but that's not quite so yeah. easy to do either. No, I'm, we've got a building set aside for the distillery. So we we are working towards getting a distillery on site, but just distilling the grain that we're growing on the estate. So we'll continue the the bond, whiskey bonding side, because I think that, that, that gives you so many different things you can play with. We've got lots of different cask finishes and lot, lots of the cast maturations ca- coming down the line. So we 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 we'll, we've got a lot of interesting things we can play with to make new whiskies, um, and uh, and I find that that that's really interesting. Yeah. Uh, so the single estate will be a, a different product. Well, maybe we'll see a hunting cap at some point. Maybe you will. Uh, but, uh, I'll, I'll have to talk to my friends at Blackwater who got the velvet cap. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so you, don't, you don't really want to be stepping too much on each other's toes. <laughs> well, um, so where can people find the Liberator? Where are you distributing that right now? Uh, we are in uh, New York and New Jersey, selected places. Uh, through our distributor, who also does uh, online sales at adiaglobal.com, A-D-Y-A-G-L-O-B-A-L.com. Um, so our whiskies are available there and hopefully more widely throughout the, the States in due course. Uh, we're working on that. Uh, but we're, we're a small brand. We have to be careful where we're, where we're sending stock because we, we want to be we want to to build the brand slowly we're, and we want to keep the quality up and that's that's going to be a, a challenge over the yeah. years to to, to you, keep the same quality are you on the continent as well 
We are, yeah, uh, with Germany and Finland, and randomly we're in uh, Shanghai as well, and uh, <laughs> and yeah, so and Ukraine it's, recently as well. Okay, um, I see you. I see you traveling around uh, all of the. the uh, I realized once I started connecting with whiskey people on LinkedIn how many whiskey uh, events there are around to to keep yeah. you busy. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. And uh, and it's also I mean the, the the shows are really expensive, so uh, our food board board beer uh, is is very good at promoting uh, Irish spirits, and they've often got stands at these shows where you can perch and and uh, and and and, and uh, so sort of instead of having your own stand, so that's been that's been helpful to us. Yeah. So is the Lakeview Estate, is that uh, available just in Ireland or is that available outside? Um, Ireland and Germany just at the moment because it's it's uh, that we've just brought out a, a second edition, uh, uh, but it's only 500 bottles. So uh, the Irish market has taken a lot of those already. So so we, we, will, we will expand that, uh, uh, but it, it takes time. And, and your uh, wife, Francesca is uh, is actually managing your social media, as I understand. So uh, she does, yes. So yeah, shout so, out to her. So, so yeah, she's, yeah. She, she's she's actually in Portugal at the moment, schmoozing she, for okay. me. Yeah. So uh, so there's a there's a couple of houses there that we want to uh, get barrels from. So uh, we we were sort of look hoping that uh, that uh, she will uh, be able to to open some more doors there. Yeah. So, uh, where where can people connect with your brand? At uh, on Instagram uh, and uh, uh, Facebook uh, at Wayward Irish Spirits. Uh, Very good. And on LinkedIn as well, and all the other ones. Okay. And your web address is www.waywardirish.com. All right, fantastic. Well, I should be more polished doing that. We should have it you should, you at should. the bottom of the screen. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm going to get punished for this later for, for yeah. not uh, pushing the social media more. So, oh, I I, I hear you, and uh, it's it's the same thing. Sometimes I will when I'm promoting my books and stuff, and I'm on a a podcast. You would think that somebody who does podcasts all the time would be ready and prepared with that kind of stuff, but for some reason, it's always like. Oh wait, where should I send people? <laughs> Plus, there's there's so many places to send people nowadays that it it, it becomes very difficult. So, um, well, thank you again for inviting me to the uh, to the estate and to get a chance to to see things firsthand and um, and for sharing your stories with me there and here on the podcast. It's it's oh, great. It's a pleasure. Then, uh, thank you very much for having me. It was yeah. really fun. Yeah, and it'll be great. Uh, now people will see your bottles on the shelf, and they'll go, oh, "I know the story behind those." Yeah. Some so, of the story. There's more. <laughs> yes, yes. Well, I'm sure we will see uh, bottlings and hear more along the way. I, so, Morris, thank you so much. My pleasure. Thank you very much for having me.